anyone who's got a dog in their life, whether you're their parent, whether you work professionally with dogs, you need to know Dr. Peter's information. Dog is not a purse. And if someone is getting a dog just to be cool or fashionable, I'd say go and see a psychologist first and see what, what the challenge really is. I absolutely love that you started on this area rather than some of the more obvious ones. So people should be really paying attention. If there is one thing that our dogs would like us to know, please, please, please be open-minded. I think it's really important that more people listen to things like this and sort of learn to ask questions and what if. And this is really important information for everyone. And it, I think it makes people feel wow, a bit of a weight off their shoulder when you sort of run through, just actually it's not as complicated as people think it's going to be. I know that most of us would do anything for our dogs. Hello everyone, Catherine here. Um, I just wanted to do a short intro because you will be seeing some videos go up on my Catherine Edwards YouTube channel my Holistic Biologist YouTube channel and my Live, Love, Learn podcast, where I'm talking about Kind of Sound Radio. Now, this is because I've been lucky enough to be invited along on this fantastic radio station, Kind of Sound, I'll put all the links below, where every two weeks, Wednesday evenings, 5.30pm UK time, I'm pretty sure that's right, yeah, um, I will be interviewing a series of guests on everything to do with animal health, human health, empowering ourselves to live the happiest, longest lives possible. All the advice is going to be really practical for people. And even when we're having the animal shows, you can apply all that advice to yourself and vice versa with the human shows. So for some of these episodes where you hear me talking about kind of sound, that's why, um, because I want the platform to be available to the the interviews to be available to my people as well. The other thing just to mention is Kind of Sound Radio. In the interviews, I invite both my all my guests to introduce two of their favourite songs and explain why they're meaningful to them. Now, on the radio show, we have a license, uh, Kind of Sound have a license to play the music, but we're not allowed to do that on YouTube. So in the YouTube versions, the actual music is missing, even though the explanations for why the guests have chosen those songs and what they mean to them are there. So please do feel free to play those songs separately and see how you resonate with them. Thank you for watching these episodes. You're going to love them. We want this message to go out to as many people as possible. And do check out the links below so that those of you that want to look up Kind of Sound, they're doing amazing work. They've got fantastic interviewers. Um, they've got uh, all the details for how you can watch and support them on all their platforms are below. Thank you for watching. So I am very excited to welcome all the listeners to this very first Holistic Biologist show with me, your host, Catherine Edwards on Kind of Sound Radio. So please do tune in every fortnight at 5.30pm UK time on Wednesdays. So this is the first show that you'll be listening to for the Holistic Biologist. So let me know what you can ex expect. Each episode, I'm going to be having an amazing guest for you, and we're going to be covering information on aspects of health, lifestyle, mindset, stress for animals and for humans. Because after all, the more we know about what the problems are, um, the better choices we can make for us and our furry friends to live long, happy and healthy lives. So for any questions to be covered or any suggestions for what you want covered on future shows, please do contact us. You can message us on Instagram and the handle for that is at Kinder Sound or on our Telegram channel and that's t.me forward slash KS Radio. So without further ado, let me introduce my very, very special guest for the first show, a dear friend of mine. So with over 30 years of experience in conventional and integrative veterinary medicine, Dr. Peter Tobias, DVM, has dedicated his professional life to helping dogs and their people prevent and treat disease naturally and to create solid foundations for a happier, healthier and longer lives together. 
And in this episode, we're going to be covering so much useful information for you. But we're going to be really looking at the top three things that your dogs want you as their humans to know to help them live the longest, happiest and healthy lives with you. So, Peter, such a pleasure to have you on this show. How are you doing? Hi, Catherine. I'm amazing. I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to be with you because we have many chats and every time we can get together, it's uh, it's really special. And um, I kind of know from previous conversations that we have a lot in common and that we often have conversations about how we got to do what we are doing and why we do it. And uh, I always learn something from me. So I'm, I'm really excited about being here today and uh, I'm grateful. Yeah. I love it. Now, for those people that haven't heard Dr. Peter talk before, I will be putting some links below to a couple of other interviews that Dr. Peter and I have had on my YouTube channel. And I'd really encourage you to listen to this because I want to make you blush now, Peter, because for the last sort of 10, 15 years, you are the person um, that I have learned most about, most from on all aspects of how to be the best dog parent. I'm very lucky like you, I grew up with animals, but every single day I learn something new. And if I've got an issue, the first place I go to is your website because you've got such a wealth of information on there. So everyone, I will be directing you to Dr. Peter's resources because anyone who's got a dog in their life, whether you're their parent, whether you work professionally with dogs, you need to know Dr. Peter's information. So we thought we'd have a bit of fun today um, because... We want to look at it from the dog's point of view. Um, and there's so much we can cover to help dog parents to really make sure they make the best decisions for their dogs. And there's always a knock on benefit for the humans with that, because often when we start thinking about these things for our animals, we think, oh, what about our diet? What about our exercise? But I want to ask you, Peter, if a dog was sitting there with you now having this conversation and he was going to a new home, what would the dog want the pet parent to really know? What would be their number one thing? Number one thing? Oh, my goodness. I think that um, I'm not going to start with diet or I'm not going to start with health. I think that the most important part that our dogs would like to, us to know is that Number one, they're very, very sensitive beings that they have to be given respect. They have to be given freedom. They love to be understood. They'd like us to have the empathy for their behavior and understanding that while we may think that they are like us, they're quite different, meaning that a dog is different than a human, very different. And we expect them, you know, just, just seeing what people do with their dogs on a daily basis or with puppies and how they talk to them in full-length sentences and, and, and sometimes punish them or scold them or pull on their collars, which breaks my heart. I think that our dogs really would love us to understand them better, but also they would love us to know that they came to us, they've come to us to solve some of the challenges that we have in our life. They've come to us to heal us. They've come to us to have a greater awareness of our emotions and how we mirror our hurts and emotions and, and, and life and our past into their life. It's, you know, there's such this is such a wide topic, but this is something that I think our dogs would like to know on the kind of deeper level, spiritual level, if we just kind of take it from, from that point of view. But when we, when we start kind of diving into the individual topics, I think they also would like us to know that we don't need to obsess about every single little thing to the point of weighing uh, you know, every nutrient and measuring every nutrient and obsessing whether our dog gets 1000 milligrams of vitamin C or 1100, they would like us to know that 20% of the steps that we take or the measures that we can take will make 80% of a difference. I find it really interesting that people are actually pretty good with babies, right? Like they don't obsess yeah. about babies, like, and they just feed babies, whatever they would eat or, you know, healthy food, ideally, and sometimes not. 
but then they would not be as obsessive about the single little details. I think that, that we get obsessive like that when we really feel lost or unsure what we should do. So I think that our dogs would like us to know that um, we can relax a little bit. And I really loved, I really loved one saying, I have no idea where I learned that, but it says something like a little bit of benign neglect doesn't hurt. It actually is beneficial. <laughs> and then on the other side of the spectrum, there is a term that my dad used to use when uh, my grandma fed us candies instead of dinner when we didn't want to eat dinner. And uh, he just called her and said, you know, this is not good for them and you shouldn't be doing that. And it's monkey love. If you do something that um, you think is out of love, but it's not really good for good for them. So the same we do with our dogs. Like there's a lot of monkey love going on, right? Like we let them beg and we let them, you know, do things that are not really good for them or give them treats that are not safe or good for them yeah. just because they want them. And at the same time, we obsess about not giving them any human food, which is total nonsense. And, you know, I think that dogs can get healthy human scraps. But, you know, yeah, they, they would like us to know so much. Um, they also would like us to know what is important in life. Yeah. Um, meaning they know exactly what is important. Connection with us and with their friends and play and good health and quality of life because they know when that is not there, they feel it. And obviously safety and food. But, you know, yeah, they they just focus on the right things. They focus on the right aspects of life. I want to pick up on some of these because I absolutely love that you started on this area rather than some of the more obvious ones. So before someone gets a dog, assuming someone is listening to this and they have, they're thinking of getting a dog for the family or for themselves and they haven't got one yet, researching what dogs need and particularly what different breeds of dogs if you're thinking about getting a, a particular breed of dogs need that can be such fun but it's so important and foundational isn't it peter i just wanted to say that today's episode is sponsored by asia redox signaling molecules now it comes in two forms the liquid and the gel plus there's a huge other product range for us um, but why did I start taking ASEA and why is it now an integral part of something that my whole family, both four-legged and two-legged, take every single day, plus also something that all the clients I work with, again, four-legged and two-legged, it's number one on my priority list? Well, part of what I do, what I'm passionate about, is understanding the challenges that are affecting each and every one of us in today's modern living. Um, the more you know, the more sometimes you wish you didn't know, but the pollution in the air, in the water, in the food, um, the control of our minds, the propaganda. But one of the things that we can do is take back responsibility for our own health. Now, every single cell of our body, whether we're an animal, whether we're one of the dogs in the backgrounds or one of my plants, contain these redox signaling molecules and cellular health and cellular communication is absolutely key whether you want to get your body back in balance, whether you want to reverse the aging process, whether you want to address any particular challenges that you've got physically, emotionally, it all starts with healthy cells. If your liver cells are healthy, your liver's healthy. If your brain cells are healthy, your brain's healthy. But just like a mobile phone, most of us have got mobile phones that we we use on a routine basis now. But that mobile phone, regardless of whether you've got the latest model, is completely useless without a signal. So what does this technology do? Um, the, the gel is something that you can apply topically over particular areas of concern, whether you want your skin to look better, whether you've got cellulite, whether you've got an area that's causing you a challenge, the liquid is something you drink each and every day to top up what should be in your cells anyway. But when our bodies are stressed, diseased, challenged, or as we age, we make less of them. 
So personally, I wouldn't be without a tip. My sleep's better. My energy levels are better. My mood's better. My mobility's better. If you want to find out more, the details are below. But I'm so grateful that this came into my life and I'm so grateful I can share it with others. I hope you love it as much as I do. Let me know. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. I, I think that people should really, first, they have to be, they have to have time. Yeah. They have to understand um, that their dog will need two to three hours of their time minimum a day. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's not okay for a dog to be locked in the condo for eight hours, nine hours. If they work nine to five, they will have to find someone to spend the time with their dog. I really am. I, you know, I know that some people are in situations where their dog is like that, but there are also many seniors that who who actually would love to have a dog for part time, and they're in such a state of their stage of their life where they don't want to get their own dog. So there's so many different different ways. So yeah, so knowing making time number one, then really dropping the idea that. If they go to dog trainer, that all dog trainers will know what to do with dogs. And, and you know, when it comes to negative uh, reinforcement and punishing dogs and creating these connections of fear and, uh, and um, negativity around their behavior, I really love the idea that we should praise the positive and prevent or ignore the negative. That's the, that's the kind of basic training um, alphabet um what else i uh, i think they should really drop the idea that they're getting a dog for their kids oh yes of, I'm any, saying of any any age like all the way to 20 or adulthood they are getting a dog for themselves and they'll be looking after that and the kids may benefit but oh my you know my daughter who is eight year old wants a puppy a really bad idea to get the puppy. You know, maybe just if you don't have time, just just dog walk someone else's dog. Again, there's a double benefit or triple benefit, right? One for the dog, one for the owner or guardian of the dog, and one for us. Um, uh, yeah, it's super important as well. Another another interesting part, and I could tell you which decade, what breed was popular, right? Yes. It, 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 when I came to Canada, it was Sharpays, strangely enough. You know, dogs with a lot of problems and dermatitis and and, and ear problems and, and difficulty to breathe and and behavior issues. And then there was Weimar runners and then it was golden retrievers, then it was Labradors, and then and, and it would go on and on and on. And so dog is not a purse. And if someone is getting a dog just to be cool or fashionable. I'd say go and see a psychologist first and see what, what the challenge really is. And, you know, maybe some people will be mad with me, but I I really think that we can resonate with a certain breed. That is not that is not a problem, yes. right? That personality type, like I love Border Collies because I have a tie with, you know, historical tie to Border Collies of my friends. And then I thought I would I would get a Border Collie. I just love the breed. They're connected and they're busy and active. Like we, we choose dogs that are like us. So, um yeah, but they're definitely not accessories. I want to just pick up on that because it is really, really important. Now, some people listening to this will be thinking about getting a dog. So our advice is very strongly research whether you're going to get a rescue or a particular breed. Mm. Look at your lifestyle and your personality and your environment to make sure you get uh, a type of dog that is going to be a fit you're going to be a fit for them and they're going to be a fit for you um because it's so so important but if someone's already got a dog peter i would say it's still a really good idea to really research you know you've got sort of different levels of hierarchies you've got dogs needs and then certain breeds of dogs have different particular needs yeah Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> some dogs would just like to lounge and lie around and some other dogs would be very active. And and the personality type is kind of predictable in the purebred dogs and a little less predictable in the mixed breeds. Uh, you were talking adoptions versus uh, you know, rescue versus not. And I, I think that 
these two camps have to come to some sort of peace, right? Because yeah. I think that rescuing dogs is obviously very, it's an amazing and very helpful thing. But sometimes it's not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I happened to be in a situation where I was looking for a border collie puppy for about six months and we were out of, we, we, we didn't have a dog for, we lost Sky about two years before then and I couldn't find a rescue border collie and I needed a puppy because my dog is trained for my sleepwalking. I sleepwalked through glass door when I was about 22 and I almost died. So I needed a border collie. I needed to train it from puppyhood. And um, I found a border collie puppy in a rescue organization. And then it took week a week to approve me. And then I was improved and I was in Europe by the, at that time. I said, you know, I'm flying out. Can you reserve? Can you hold the puppy for me? No holding, right? And so, so then he kind of, go man like I, I I really admire most rescue organizations because they're cool but sometimes I feel that that kind of power over people who are kind of coming and almost begging hey give me the puppy some of some of those people are not that kind like we found an amazing dog in the Rocky Mountains when we were hiking about a year ago and I and our friends who adopted another rescue dog that we fostered lost her and they were looking for a dog. And I came to this rescue lady and said, listen, like we have amazing, amazing family for this dog. And they would want the whole family to drive thousand kilometers. They would want, they, they absolutely refused to actually me giving, giving the, the guarantee that the dog would be looked after. And it was such a gong show that I thought, I'm not surprised that sometimes people just go, you know, I just don't want to go through this time. But I don't want to discount the, the important role that rescue organizations have. But, you know, I said that we have to make peace or come to some sort of understanding that the purebred dogs are important from heritage point of view, from cultural point of view, from working point of view. And you just almost like they're, they're, they're art that the humans created, sometimes not very successfully. You know, we forget that dogs need to be able to breathe and uh, and and move and and have certain characteristics. But I think breeders are as well important. And I, you know, I I'd say let's try to rescue whenever we can, but also let's try to support and and not not defamate the the efforts of breeders who are basically trying to preserve the tradition. And it's a hobby, and it's you know, it's amazing to know that there are certain. That we've been able from the from the from the primordial dog, we've been able to create all of these different species. Isn't that beautiful? It's like it's a miracle that we have the same. Animals. Yeah. So and so many have so many important roles. You know, if you've got a sheep farm, you need a working dog to do that, and they love to do that work mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. So I think that is really really important. Um, and I think um, also in terms of. Um, understanding being really honest with yourself and what your capabilities are and yes. your needs are I will just say one thing I'd love your opinion on this Peter um there's a lot of to, to me I know a lot of very responsible dog breeders that really maintain the integrity of certain breeds for certain mm -hmm. reasons and do a lot of health checks before breeding and breed them in a very responsible manner and then we've got what I would call the new type of breeders where they just want to breed, um, you know, a classic example will be the doodles. We've got the doodle everything now, every possible yes. type of doodle, yes. because they look incredibly cute. But often when people are doing that, they're not necessarily um, getting the same level of care of attention. Have you got any words of warning for that for people? I don't really know why this trend happened especially in north america maybe in the uk as well i don't see it as much in europe actually almost at all um i think part of it is that people really want to they kind of you know we want everything perfect right so they go okay i like i like the poodles and i like the golden retrievers and i want to cross them and i will have a perfect dog um then second there is the fashion trend i definitely think that that's it um, I find it kind of funny that people kind of establish those. They, they think that these dogs are breeds, which they're not, uh, but I'm fine with it. You know, call it whatever you want. Um, I think these dogs are lovely. 
I don't, you know, but obviously um, they're not bred with mindfulness and focus on health and function and longevity. When we see that, let's say, Bernese Mountain Dogs are probably one of the shortest living breeds, maybe bringing them with another dog or with another breed would, would actually be beneficial. But at the same yeah. time, it's very likely that we are going to introduce some genes that are not that favorable. Um, it's very complicated. You know, Catherine, I, I don't have a big problem with people actually doing that, even though I am curious about the whys. Um, yeah, uh, uh, but I, I am worried that 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 the the traditional kind of the traditional breeds and the responsible breeding yeah. and focus on function and job and and um, maybe even you know body characteristics and so on will be lost. I I, I have one example actually that that. It's really strange, but I will mention it anyway. So in Prague, where I spent half of the year, because I'm from the Czech Republic originally, I've lived in Canada for 30 years. In Prague, there is a place uh, where there's a wall. And originally it started with, with a big painting of Lenin. People started putting little art and graffiti and, and so on. And it, it's become really beautiful. And, and it's kind of a place for people to come and reflect and celebrate freedom and so on. And about two years ago, they repainted the wall and artists basically from different countries in, in European Union actually came and painted this amazing oh. wall. And then as other people started adding, it became a complete mess. Yeah. And only the upper section was still, because people couldn't reach it, it was still the art. But the lower section is, it's nothing. And it's a blend. Like, you know, I usually say when people start kind of blending and kind of like there is no structure or form, it becomes really just one. And and I think that it's really easy to kind of take the breeds and mess them up and all that stuff. But it would be and will be very difficult to restore them and keep them healthy and, and all that. So I'm I'm a little worried that when we... When we do without any awareness or control what we've done with the breeds, I'm not really 100% sure that it's actually favorable for yeah. the canine species. But I'm also not like, you know, I'm not saying, oh, I'm going to dedicate the next five years to kind of make sure that this is going to stop. No, I understand no, what people all. do. It. It's yeah. fine. And I have empathy. And maybe one day I'm going to have a whatever doodle <laughs> <You never Yeah. know. laughs> I think it's really really important that people give a lot of thought and attention and research where they're getting their dog from so whether it's a rescue mm -hmm. or rehomed one because there's lots of rescue dogs that don't come with a lot any problems because mm -hmm. you know there's circumstances where the owners die or are unable to look after them anymore and so there's lots of very um you know ready to go family pets in rescues and equally, if you've got a particular desire for a particular breed because it's a working dog or you know that's going to fit your lifestyle and you've done your research, I think supporting the good rescues, the good breeders is really, really important because at the end of the day, if we do that, then the dogs win because their welfare, we're supporting the ones that have got the dog's welfare in, in mind. So, so I think probably from this first section, it's really people should be really paying attention to where they get their dogs from, what type of dog is right for them and what type, you know, what are they right for? What breeds of dogs are they the right parent for? You know, and, and pay attention to training and pay attention to the characteristics of the breed. Like if, you know, like I, for example, I would never get a German Shepherd. Not that I like them. They're beautiful, gorgeous dogs, but they're a little more reactive, right? And yeah. uh, most of them, not all, but most of them. And so you don't really, you have to understand that if you do have that dog, that you have to be actually very experienced. It's like driving a Ferrari. Like I would not be driving a Ferrari because I don't really know. First, I wouldn't want it. But second, I wouldn't know how to drive it. You were telling, you were you were talking about the responsible breeding and I we forgot one thing and that is um, the issue of puppy mills because, you know, with the, with, the, with the trendy breeds and the trends, there are many puppy mills that kind of pretend to be responsible owners, right, right and breeders. 
So we really have to like if if someone is looking for a dog, I would really kind of research the information about the particular breeder if you don't go through rescue and make sure that 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 you see the puppies, you see the mom, you see where they are and so on, because these dogs unfortunately get badly abused. It's heartbreaking to see. Um, usually the puppies don't get what they need, so they're problematic dogs. And ultimately, you know, I I tried it many, many times to talk to my clients who were kind of thinking, you know, I'm gonna, I know that this is not a good situation, but I'm gonna rescue this puppy. But unfortunately, rescuing these puppies means that we are actually supporting the 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 practices of these puppy mills and make them exist. So it's I would say that it's really important and and imperative that we don't go there even though we may not in quotes rescue the particular dog that is absolutely not you know it's not their fault uh we we really have to prevent ourselves from from going there um, yeah. and and report these organizations ideally uh, lobby the go local governments to make sure that these organizations can't exist in the jurisdictions and 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 that we stop this horrible practice i so agree so we're going to take a little break now and i'm going to in ask you just to introduce the name and the artist of your first song, please, Peter. Um, you know, when he asked me asked me for uh, two songs, I I have a playlist of hundreds, but there is one song that is quite unusual and at the same time really amazing, and it's by Ennio Morricone, who is an Italian composer, modern classical composer, and uh, this piece is from the movie the mission and it's called gabriel's oboe and it's played by yo-yo ma which is another artist who is amazing um there are the ones that i don't cry very often when it comes to music but they make me cry every single time so this is the song the first song lovely we'll take a break and listen to that we'll be back soon so welcome back to the holistic biologist show with me your host Catherine edwards on Kinder Sound Radio, and I am here with my lovely guest, Dr. Peter Tobias. So before we get into the next point about what our dogs want us to know, just tell me a little bit about that song, Peter, that we've just played and why it's so special for you. You know, I, I, <laughs> you caught me by surprise because I didn't expect this question, and I'll tell you how I feel about this song. It's, it's, it's not about, it's not about, anything particular other than that evokes a feeling of harmony that I feel that the piece is just beautifully put together. And you Morricone is one of the composers that I actually have seen in real life with the Czech Philharmonia Orchestra. And as I said, he made me cry. Like my niece and I went to the concert and we were bawling our eyes the whole time. And it actually makes you feel, it makes you be a little surprised because I don't cry very often. And, but it's absolutely out of control. So I think that when a vibration frequency, when music, when the rendition of this piece actually is presented, I, you know, it just touches my heart and that's why I like it. The movie Mission, the mission is actually, it's, it's a very interesting movie. It's a little dark as well. Um, but the piece is one, it's one of the best pieces of modern times, I think. Uh, yeah, it just, I, I love it. <laughs> love it. And very apt because we have been talking before the break about dogs and, and the three things that every dog wants their parent to know. And in part one, we covered a lot of about really how much thought before you get a dog, understanding the type of dog you've got, their particular needs, um, is really important. And we know dogs have such big hearts and no wonder that resonates with you. But now we want to move on to your number two, Peter. So the dog's sitting here and you're having the conversation with the dog. They've, they've spoken about all the stuff we've spoken about in part one. What's the next thing every dog want us parents to mm. understand to help them live mm. long, happy and healthy lives? 
I, you know, I could jump to nutrition right away because it's what everyone expects. And I hope that we'll have time to talk about it today or maybe in next uh, broadcast. I think I'm going to go to callers. Good. Um, and the reason is so many people don't even think twice about what callers are. They just put it on their puppy and the puppy pulls and tugs and wants to say hi to other dogs or sniff something. And there is just constant constraint, constant constriction. Now, <laughs> imagine that we would put a collar on a baby. Like people would be just horrified. Yeah. But it is no different because a living being that has something around their neck and the neck is very vulnerable. Uh, the neck is the place where the most vital blood vessels and nerves are the thyroid gland the 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 vagal the the vagus nerve that basically supplies the heart and the lungs and the digestive tract and the kidneys and so on it's directly related um also the nerves to the front feet go to go go to the feet from the neck so the 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 front feet are supplied from the nerves by the nurse from the neck um so the first thing that I think our dogs would want us to know that the collar is really uncomfortable and that while we need to keep our dogs safe, especially in street setting and city setting, it is not okay to put a collar on them. And that 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 is usually how many of the health problems start. And I'll give you just a few examples. Can I just ask before you go on to yeah. this episode, yeah. Peter? Are you talking about leading a dog from a collar or because I mean, a lot of countries actually need a collar around with a yes. name tag. Yes. yes, absolutely. So I just want to clarify, uh, and this is my my bad that I didn't make it clear. It's not about the collar because collars are good for putting the tag on and the ID or even tracker if your dog is off leash and likes to run off. Um, sometimes collars are just good to look at, right? Like, yeah. uh, you know, many people just like to, so it is not about the collar, the placement of the collar, but the fact that we put the lead on uh, the collar. The only thing is that many people make collars too tight and that can be a problem. So there could be at least two fingers that, that should fit between the neck and, uh, and the collar and really loosely. Uh, harnesses are the best way to go if it's properly fit harness. I use harnesses uh, that are actually from the UK and they're called Perfect Fit. Uh, a really I've great got company. those too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's Perfect Fit. It's three modular harness. Uh, you know, it's great. I, I, I don't use anything else. Um, so yeah, I think that that's something that, that dogs want us to know. Um, dogs also would like us to know that the retractable leashes mm may cause significant harm because they usually pull, pull, pull. So there's a lot of pressure developed on the thyroid gland, on the blood vessels, on the muscles, on the nerves. Um, and then they get to the end and there is a jerk, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like being a chiropractor without being a chiropractor. <laughs> Not a good idea. Uh, so we are kind of creating these micro trauma that over time actually result in a big trauma. And as I said, there is a direct a relationship between the spinal health and neck health and the rest of the body. Um, the neck is, from my perspective, the governing area for energy flow in the body, for spinal flow, nerve supply, blood supply, and so on. One of the most common conditions, and it happens in medium and especially large dogs, is hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. And um, every time I get an opportunity to kind of talk to dog lover seeing that their dog pulls, I talk about hypothyroidism because um, the thyroid gland is right under the collar. Um, the gland gets traumatized, inflamed, the immune system goes, ha, ah, inflammation, I have to remove these cells. And when those cells are removed, dogs don't have an ability to produce sufficient amount of thyroid hormone. And that's how hypothyroidism in many instances happens. Of course, there's immune component to the condition and so on, but I, I do find it curious that small dogs don't really get that because they don't develop that force. They don't pull as strongly. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, the break, the break that is a that is on the leash, on the retractable leash, again, very harsh. And 
people just don't realize that. And I would like everyone to understand that retractable leashes may look really cool and convenient and most people use them. They're the number one thing that I would get rid of and then attaching the lead to the collar. That's the number two. Um, I use a leash. So with that, you had got some brilliant examples of um, things that people wouldn't think were associated with that with R. So can you talk through two specific examples? One is dogs chewing their paw and two digestive issues and how they could be related to this. Yeah, so so paw chewing definitely um, is often related to neck injuries and neck trauma. If you think of your neck, hmm. If we have sore neck, we sometimes may have tingling in our hands and feet and people, not feet, hands. <laughs> um, and dogs, when when this happens, dogs don't have the ability to actually do anything to, to kind of tell us. They just start licking because it's abnormal. There is some sort of sensation, pin and needles, uh, itching, whatever it is. Then they start licking those areas and they cause micro trauma. Also, when the energy and nerve flow and blood flow doesn't doesn't happen as openly and readily, uh, the skin and the structures of the whole foreleg may be weakened by that. Yeah. So dogs will have actually skin that is more sensitive as a result of that. I find it really frustrating, but I have a lot of empathy with that, uh, that, that many of my colleagues don't connect the, the paw licking with neck injuries and almost always go to allergies or some sort of fungal or bacterial condition, which is usually secondary if it's if it's there. Um, so that's something that I'd like to like people to learn and know. You know, the reason why I love talking about these things because they're so, so simple yep. and people can be aware and they can prevent so many problems without needing to go to the vet. So when I started my online work and uh, and decided that I would love to empower dog lovers around the world, it was because I was seeing the same conditions coming to the practice and repeating. And it is so trivial and so simple that 20% of the knowledge that, that makes 80% difference is actually quite embarrassingly simple. You don't need to have a veterinary degree. You don't have to be a scientist, researcher, but we don't know what we don't know. And and so if there is one thing that our dogs would like us to know and they would like to, to say is, please, please, please be open-minded to other possibilities. Don't be too rigid in how you see the world, how you see health, because if we are rigid, then we may miss some important solutions. We may we may miss the key to certain conditions. And, and also, 99 people can be saying one thing, and the one person may be actually correct. And it's intimidating, even in the veterinary world. Like, you know, when I started practicing, you just want to fit, and you just don't want to be, you know, and, and there's, this, there's this attitude. It's almost like a, a little bit of a, bullying attitude when someone doesn't fit in the preconceived mold in the mold of let's say conventional medicine in the mold of cookbook medicine it it's hard it's hard because people suddenly you know people may ridicule you people may um publicly openly pick fights and arguments. And if you're, let's say, one against 50, what do you do? But as time progresses, you realize that it's okay. And that, you know, when you look at history, I don't know exactly what the saying is, but they say first they laugh at you, then they possibly hear you, and then, then you know, they, they go along with you, right? There's like Normally some... after you've died by that stage. He what knows. was that? Normally, after the person who raised the the new idea has died, do they suddenly yeah, realize, or perhaps yeah, they were right? Yeah, off. yeah, yeah. The yeah. is always the first place. So, if you're if you're a dog parent and your dog's got digestive issues, if they've got paw licking and things, it's so important, isn't it, when you go to your vet to sort of say, "Oh, could you just check their back?" Or, you know, you and I are a big fan of, um, say, chiropractic treatment for dogs is very, very important. Mm -hmm. 
you wanted me to talk about digestive issues. So I, you know, um, is it uh, in relationship with collars or is it in relationship with the spine? What would you like to? Well, because it, um, I know that spinal problems and mm -hmm. collar issues could be related to that can manifest in other things. So for example, if someone's got a dog, you had an example with a spinal issue with your first dog, Sky, didn't you, mm -hmm. when he was a mm -hmm. puppy? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so first, I'm going to uh, kind of focus on the collar and how yeah. it could affect digestive tract, and then I'm going to talk about the story of Sky and 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 what happened and what he taught me. Obviously, our dogs always want us to know that they are there to teach us. They're bringing wealth of knowledge, and if we're open, then 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 they'd be happy to provide it. Um, so, going to the collars. Um, the vagus nerve is the nerve that basically governs some of the internal organs, like the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the digestive tract, and so on. It's the it's the nerve that becomes more active when we digest, uh, becomes less active when um, when we exercise, and so on. There's this yin and yang uh, system of sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve fibers, and the vagal nerve is actually part of the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so when dogs pull or when they injure their neck, it can definitely affect the heart or the lungs or the digestive tract. So you know, going back to the spinal column, I see it as a as the energy highway in the body. Mm. Or even better, you can imagine that it's a watering system in the garden. And you know that most mm. of watering systems have, have branches. And if let's say one branch of the watering system is when there is a hole or it's pinched the hose or something happened, then the garden beds basically don't thrive and maybe the veggies will even die. And so the same thing happens in the spinal column where certain segments actually supply the blood, nerve flow and energy flow, if you want to call it that way, because in Chinese medicine, we acknowledge that as, um, as, you know, as uh, the qi or energy. Uh, if these segments get blocked, then the particular segment, whether it's skin or organ, doesn't thrive. And so the digestive tract, especially the large and small intestine, get the spinal supply from the lumbar area. And there are numerous instances where dogs injure the lumbar spine, whether it's slipping and sliding, or they do a lot of one-sided exercise like sprinting and chasing and breaking and so on. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done at all. I'm saying yeah. that it has to be done with mindfulness and also understanding that they can get injured. And when they get injured, the muscles get tight, the nerves and the blood, blood vessels and the energy flow will, will stop supplying that particular area. And, you know, imagine that it's a garden bed. Let's say that, 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 that the intestinal tract is the garden bed. And when the lumbar area gets tight and injured and inflamed, the muscles tighten and the energy flow doesn't, doesn't get to the intestinal tract as readily. And we start having diarrhea or constipation or whatever else it is. So when I got Sky, he definitely was a good teacher because maybe month five or six, he started having chronic diarrhea. And I had no idea how to stop it. I basically used all the tools in my box from conventional to holistic medicine and nothing worked. And it got to the point where I had him on IV fluids and I was thinking, this is not happening. Like I should know how to solve this and I don't really know. And then I started reading Chinese medicine literature and just kind of like, you know, kind of checking and making sure that I'm not missing something. And the reference of the digestive tract in the lumbar area came to came to me. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've been really chasing, I've been letting him chase the ball all the time. And so I checked the spinal column and especially the lumbar area and, and, and it was really injured. And so I went to my friend chiropractor, she did a few adjustments and the diarrhea was gone. Wow. And I used some homeopathic remedies for releasing the, the muscle spasm and tightness. Um, and, you know, it was great. He was never perfect, meaning that the propensity to his uh, digestive tract weakness was there as a, as a you know, inherited, inherited tendency. But I learned how to manage it. And he lived 16 years and he was 
was really happy and really great. So, so you know, since then, I've helped many clients solving the diarrhea issue. I'm not necessarily saying that I'm not going to address all the other parts, like, you know, yeah. there is no bacteria, that this pathogenic, uh, ensuring that the microbiome is healthy, ensuring the diet is fine, like all that is actually, it plays a role. But what if there is a case that doesn't respond to that? And, and Skye was, Sky was one of those dogs. There was another piece of the puzzle. And I have actually one client and very dear friend of mine from the UK, Michelle, whose dog had exactly the same challenge and problems. And, you know, 10 years later, she's still talking about it, how simple it was and how she was going back and back to the veterinary clinic where she goes and, and, and they couldn't solve it. And when I hear that, it makes me really happy. But I also go, well, you know, I don't really deserve that much credit because it's really simple. We all could know that if we share the information with each other and are open, right? Open-minded. Yeah. And, and there is a little bit of dogmatism when it comes to veterinary education. Also, we just get in the rut of cookbook medicine and we don't talk to each other as much, or maybe we do, but you know, it's complicated. So I wouldn't really, I don't want this to come across as saying, hey, you know, my colleagues are doing this intentionally. There's many, there are many things that I don't know how to solve and other colleagues can help me to solve them. And that's why we need to talk and be, be open-minded. Yeah, the open-mindedness, that's something yeah. that our dogs want us to know uh for sure i love that and i you know for myself as a, a as a dog parent i think it's really important that more people listen to things like this and sort of learn to ask questions and what if and also to make sure if you're going to a vet or a holistic practitioner or a chiropractor with your dog you give them as much information as possible so for example if your dog is chewing but make a note and take pictures of where they're chewing or take a little video because the more information as they're owner that you can give the practitioner the better they're going to be able to solve the problem and work out the root cause because all of these little behavioral things are giving you a clue mm -hmm. and because our dogs can't talk to us in the way they want to it's our job as their parents to really notice these little things and just take note of them because if there is a change like that there's always a reason for it that is very true and um but I also would like people to be kind to themselves because they shouldn't beat themselves up if they miss something. Um, there's so much to learn, but there is there are some basics that can really open your mind. So, you know, what I do usually with people when um, they come to me or if I have some new subscribers, I try to teach them something that I've called a healing cycle. And it's the basic principles of, uh, of maintaining health. And this principle or these principles actually follow what nature does. It follows nature. Um, and, and it's relatively simple. I'm not sure whether we have space to talk about it. But let's I... talk about it now, because I think we should leave. Let's talk about the healing cycle now to close off the show, because this is really important information for everyone. And it, <laughs> I think it makes people feel wow, a bit of a weight off their shoulder when you sort of run through, just actually mm -hmm. it's not as complicated as people think it's going to be. Go for yeah. it. Yeah, I think that it's not complicated. It just it requires discipline and, and just certain basic understanding. And I get really passionate about it. And and over the years, I've been a little, little intrigued. Well, I haven't been intrigued, but I know that people usually come to me when they they have a problem, right? So yeah. I, and, and the healing cycle can be applied. But I've been, at certain point, <laughs> I've been feeling really frustrated that I have been unable to convince people that this is something that they should pay attention before it's too late. Yeah. Uh, you know, when disease strikes, it's much more difficult to actually solve it. And sometimes it's too late. When, you know, I'm going to talk about relationships or marriages, like we go to the gym, we eat healthy, but then we don't really pay attention to maintaining the relationship and working on it and so on until it's almost too late, right? And so health, going back to health, um, healing cycle is really simple. So 
for the latest, for the longest time, I I was trying to kind of make the the whole system of healing and health simple enough to be able to present it. And then I thought, well, you know, nature has it really beautifully figured. Uh, if you think what nature does, um, there's a everything is in a cycle uh, from nutrient recycling you know the plants grow and then they're eaten and then the 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 herbivores are eaten by the carnivores and then it goes back to the earth and there's a beautiful cycle um then you have the cleansing processes so the first one is nourishment right and and making it just just ideally closed the the food cycle should be closed we have done a lot of damage to that we transport food the food doesn't get back to the soil where it came from and so on so that's the first area that we need to address Second, when we look at nature, it's uh, the cleansing processes. You see the rain cleansing everything and washing everything in the rivers. And then the, uh, the microorganisms and the systems in nature basically cleanse it. It's from the, the, the bacteria to animals to surf and oxygen and the sun and sun rays. Like it's a cleansing process. And then... Then there's a general tendency to for nature to reset everything back to where it was, right? So there is a there is a certain cycle in in the seasons. There is a certain cycle in life, and so on. So resetting, and uh, then in the in the in the kind of like past decade or so, we've been really focusing on how nature uh, repairs DNA, how we can prevent aging how does nature do it why some animals and some microorganisms or some organisms actually why they live so much longer uh when we introduce certain substances that are actually natural so going back to the practical sense um and going back to nutrition if it's okay um the most important part is to feed species appropriate food and our dogs would like us to know that they would prefer eating food that they would normally eat in nature. Um, I don't know many wolves or coyotes that would graze in the field of grain or corn. It just doesn't happen. But they do eat berries beside the prey animals and meat and bones and organs. They eat berries and they eat grass and, and they do eat some plant material. So they would like us to know that. Um, I don't know any doctors, human doctors, that would say, oh, you know, you should eat only processed food. And I know many veterinarians who have been saying that. We, <laughs> veterinarians, have, have been an interesting kind. We are a little bit of a soldier type. We kind of follow the instructions very well. We, we are relatively good students. We were chosen that way. But we are having a hard time to believe that someone could actually use us to support their agenda. Mm -hmm. Pet food industry. We know how pet food started. Uh, a person who has not, I can't really remember his name, but you know that, that, that the original pet food maker was in construction or maybe in some sort of other work. And he started, you know, he thought, oh, there is a lot of leftovers of food from human consumption. Maybe I could just put it together, put it together and make dog cakes. I can't remember his name. Do you remember his name? The, I can't the... remember his name. I know yeah. it's in the, uh, the dog book I've got there, but it is so important. It's a lot of these things. It's like Chinese whispers where people think they've yeah. been started on some scientific yeah. foundation and they just haven't. And and so so, you know, Basically, over the years, we've been convinced that dogs should not get any human table scraps, that they shouldn't get salt, which I have no idea why why anyone could recommend it, because all the animals like horses and, and deer, we give them salt licks and we make sure that they have yeah. salt and so on. Suddenly, dogs shouldn't have any salt. And I'm not necessarily saying that you should be always feeding your dog human food, but it's not a problem. But it's a good way of convincing people that they should not get anything else than scientifically you know, crafted or formulated kibble. And when you look at the formulations, it's mind blowing because it's like wheat gluten and corn and, and rice oh, and brewer's yeast and, and this and that. And it's and byproducts and it is, you know, and 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 the puppy food is actually different. 
um, from the senior food only by the ingredient proportions. But I actually looked at a few of these recipes and they're the same and they have the same crap in them. And, and one thing I would love to do one day, I'd like to have very mindful, very, um, very peaceful conversation with some of these pet food manufacturers or even candid but not public conversation. So I really learned what they're thinking, but they really believe what they're doing is actually good for our dogs. So going back to why people feed kibble, I know that people feed kibble because it's convenient, because they were told that that's the good thing to do, that it's balanced, they're worried that they wouldn't balance it and so on. We have created, I've created a healthy dog food recipe maker on my website, it's all free, people can go there. Uh, people can also go to healthy dog tool, which uh, would give them an idea how to solve some of the challenges and problems they deal with. It would give them customized plan. It would give them suggestion for supplements they should be giving and so yeah. on. You know, healthy dog food is actually either raw food. And, and there's many reasons why, like we would not be surprised if wolves and coyotes eat raw food or tigers. But, you know, dogs are dogs and they have the same digestive tract as wolves. Like you would not recognize it histologically. Uh, but there is another problem. And so going back to the healing cycle, diet is important, but because we've, re we've been um, affecting the food chain to the point of, you know, soil being depleted and overused and so on, we need to actually supply or supplement some of the nutrients. So part of the dietary kind of step of the healing cycle is to supplement omega oils, vitamins, ideally fermented vitamins, which is very difficult to get, but, you know, there are some, and, and I've, formulated one as well. Uh, so uh, vitamins, omega oils, probiotics, and minerals and amino acids. And if you do that, then you basically have provided the essential nutrients that your dog cannot make. Brilliant. We're going to have to stop it there, I'm afraid, because we're out of time. But I just want to summarize that for people. Your website, drpeterdebias.com? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. On there, I want everyone after this show to go and have a look. Go and have a look at the free dog recipe maker. Let us know by um, clicking on, by connecting in with Kind of Sound on Instagram. Put in the holistic biologist. And if you'd like us to come back and do a show specifically on diet, on detoxing, on, on supplements, because I think that would be so important. Um, let us know what you think in the comments because we want to be here to help you get the best relationship you can with your dogs. Peter, honestly, I could talk with you for so long. Thank you so much for your time today. Absolute wealth of information. Um, let's play out with your final song. Just give us a little bit of information about what the song is and why it's special to you and how it relates to dogs. Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, the, the song that I would like to play is uh, from Brian Adams, who's from Vancouver, where I've lived for 30 years. And it's called Everything I Do, I Do It For You. Obviously, it could apply to anyone and especially our dogs as well, because I know that most of us would do anything for our dogs. And mm -hmm. that's why maybe next time we can talk about the rest of the healing cycle. I apologize that we didn't have time and that I went so long, but they're just oh, away. Thank you so much. There's so much information. Oh, yeah. thank you so much. Enjoy this song, everyone. And let us know what you'd like us to discuss next time. Get those questions in. And thank you for tuning in to the first episode of The Holistic Biologist on Kind of Sound Radio. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. And if you feel inspired, please do share with your friends and family. My goal is to inspire as many people as I can to live their best lives, to stay curious and to raise their consciousness and that of the collective. So to do this, I need to reach as many people as possible and this needs your help. If you feel drawn, would you be willing to share your favourite episode with five different people? This helps us spread the word and also helps me encourage some exciting new guests to take part in this podcast. If you feel drawn to do that, I will be very, very grateful. All the links and discount codes where applicable for the products that I support are on my two websites, 
katherineedwards.life and katherineedwardsacademy.com. All of the products are personally tried and tested by me, my family and my clients. And finally, please do press the follow or subscribe button, depending which platform you're listening on. And above all, stay curious and stay free. Mm -hmm.